Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of the Bucket and Hoosier Show. As always, I am Mr. Hoosier, and the gentleman sitting next to me, always willing to have a good conversation, is none other than Bucket. Bucket, how are you doing, buddy? What's up, brother? Um, I'm doing well. The last time we spoke was almost exactly a week ago. It was a week ago. Was it Monday of last week? We're on track now. This is the beautiful, beautiful thing about when you get your... Um, your wheels going and you can get some sort of rhythm feels nice to have a set schedule. So that's what I'm all about right now is trying to keep the momentum from the new year into February and just keep everything rolling and not, not forgetting, um, why I made some of the decisions I did on January 1st. Right? No, that's perfect. I mean, that is the toughest part about the new year. If you try and change it up, do something new is when you get right into February is being able to keep it going and hoping that you don't lose that enthusiasm or the motivation that you had to keep doing it. So good on you. I'm behind. Um, hopefully I'll catch up, but I mean, that's typical, right? Um, dude, there was some good RLCS this weekend. How much did you get? To oh watch? yeah. Didn't even think about that. No, I did. I, <laughs> I got to watch a good bit on f- the first day. Was that Friday? I didn't watch a lot on Saturday, and then I watched all of Championship Sunday. So got to see a lot of those cool, um, the Swiss stuff, and then the the final, so yeah, what Fri- was it, three or four matches? Yeah, Friday was the Swiss format, and then went into Saturday in the single elimination bracket, and... In case you missed anything, I got some for you. I didn't tell you about this, but it's a new segment if he keeps doing it every week on Twitter and keeps giving me the permission to just use what he's putting up on Twitter. We have the Pulse Pop Wrap Up. So Pulse Pop on Twitter, I checked with him and he's been doing these wrap ups. Uh, I know he's done them uh, in the past, but he's continuing to do them. And here is the wrap up of RLCS from this past weekend. So we start with Limitless successfully defended SSA by sweeping the English team of Young Money Clan in the finals. And I know we saw probably the a great epic clip of that with Greybeard just full of joy that his SSA boys were able to hold it down and not let anybody come in there and take the region over. So huge, huge congrats over there to those guys. I know they are completely stoked. Um, then we move on to APAC. Elevate one in APAC with Sphinx as the youngest player to ever win in a regional. Um, I believe he's 14, which is kind of a bummer mm. that we didn't get to see that like on the mainstream, but pretty big news there. The first 14 year old uh, to actually win a regional. And then we go to uh, power absolutely dominated OCE. The Falcons went 21 and two in their games and beat rule one to win in Mina. Complexity sweeps Furia in the Sam Finals to win in the first El Clasico of 2024. I know that must have been a fire game. I didn't get to watch it, but I'm sure with those two teams, it was fantastic. And then we get to NA. So OG, as he put, OG got last in NA. But did they really? Because they got through the open qualifiers. So they didn't get last, but they did not have a good, uh, a good Swiss bracket, which... I'm still kind of, I, I don't remember how they did the seating, but uh, OG had Gen G and then Dignitas. So that first matchup with Gen G, that's the, um, I believe the only match that they took where they got one game. Um, everything else was uh, 03 sweeps. Uh, looking over it real quick. Yeah, 03 by Dig, and they play Pirates on the Boat. And Pirates on a Boat swept them 3-0, which Pirates on a Boat looked really good this weekend for a non-org team. And uh, Five Up over there was definitely doing his thing. Um, Then we had Snowmen, which I did not realize. uh, I realized that they got top 10. What I didn't realize is they are the youngest team ever to to compete in RLCS, with Scrabbles being the first 14-year-old in RLCS. So I did not realize that team getting into... Uh, Swiss stage and the bracket that they were that young of a team, but kudos to them or they didn't get into the bracket. Uh, they just got into Swiss. So very 
huge kudos to them. You couldn't even do that. So um, those kids are better than you. Um, Probably true. And then Dignitas and Rebellion Shop and Shopify Rebellion had impressive top four runs. And then G2 in fantastic form, they swept Gen G in the finals to put them as NA's number one. He says for now, that's what Pulse Pop says, but I'm going to say they are NA's number one team. Um, they might start off slow at times, but they are definitely the team to beat right now. Um, but that, that was the Pulse Pop wrap up. So there you go. Thank you to Pulse Pop for, for letting us use that. Oh, you didn't hear it? Nope. But that was pretty, that was a pretty good rundown. And I did, I did see a lot of that stuff. When I say I didn't, I only watch Friday and Sunday. I watched those live, right? Like I was able to go back and see some replays and then also keep up with a lot of that, those, those stories. I'd say that was probably a good roundup of the weekend. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really good way to start off the show, man. Nice, did I say nice Scrabbles? You came up with something. Did I say Scrabbles? I didn't I did. hear it. I think I did. Uh, <laughs> Prime Dad reminded me in chat, it's Scribble, you not Scrabble. Just, just go scrap every time. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah just, that works. But, I mean, it, there, there was a lot to try and catch up with this weekend since everything was pretty much crammed down our throats and we didn't have coverage of everything. So anybody that was out there Dumb. doing a team stream, um, like shout out to Greybeard for keeping up with what was going on. The community thanks you for that. Um, don't and don't. It's wanna, so hard, man. It, it's very hard. It, it they they've made it so tough now. Um, don't, definitely don't want to uh, gloss over really quick. The EU EU did their open qualifiers in the same weekend that all this was going on, and a lot of your normal teams that are there: Carmine Corp, Vitality, Endpoint, BDS, Oxygen, Moist, um, and then Resolve is there. There's a lot of non. Teams that I recognize in uh, Wild, Magnifico, uh, Four Wheel Drive, I'm guessing that's what it is. Uh, Beligo, Team 3, Redemption, Gentle Mates, Al Mates Alpine, and uh, 100%. So this next weekend should hopefully have a good coverage of it and seeing their, their Swiss stage on Friday and going into their single elimination tournament this week, bracket this weekend. So it should be good. But. Awesome. Um, yeah, right now, yeah, Gen Gen or not Gen G G two is the team to beat. That there's no doubt about it. And uh I hope I hope Greg and them over on Luminosity can get something because there was there were times when you could tell Luminosity had had their number and it just it just slowly slipped away from them. So I, I think I think the boys in L G are there and they're gonna make a good showing this next open qualifier, which before we move on, are you playing an open qualifier too? No comment. What? <laughs> what do you mean no comment? Uh, no comment. I'm, I'm on a roster again, but it'll uh, it'll come down to the weekend. We'll see. You guys should be scrimming. Can I mean we have yeah. a podcast? Can Who's, you not? I didn't get say scrims? we're not. I don't listen. I got no time for this. <laughs> Um, it's, it's just not the first thing on my list, man. Well, that's fair, but we know the podcast is first in your heart, which we all appreciate you for. And, uh, today, um, uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, he, I believe it's the owner of, Fro uh, owner of Frost Esports. Um, he has been sharing a lot of thoughts on Twitter with where RLCS is going and what that, what that looks like for orgs. And then he's also been on a on a mission himself right now to try and fix things that are not going well in the esports uh, scene as a whole when it comes to paying out their players for tournaments. And uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is Maverick. Maverick, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. Well, we're glad that you're able to come on and chat with us and tell us what's going on from your perspective of things. Uh, for anybody that's out there listening, can you just give us a brief intro intro of yourself? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the owners of Frost Esports. Um, I'm also the founder of Latency, which is essentially a, 
a company that's been kind of building tools for um, for gamers and, and competitors for the last couple of years. Uh, we built two tools specifically for that kind of stuff. Um, my background's mostly in content creation. I've been working with content creators, kind of coaching them on how to be professional. Um, and funny enough, I got kind of my first exposure to content creation by running podcasts. Um, oh, so really? <laughs> Old circle. <laughs> there you go. Um, that's yeah. awesome. Um, before we get into the other stuff, you talk about like coaching content or content creators oh. on being professional. What have you found in your time with doing that? Like, what what's something that most people miss when when they're getting into content creation? Yeah, I think I think one of the biggest things is just <laughs> I'll be kind of rude about it, but wasting your time. Oh, you know? Okay. There's, there's a lot of creators that just hit live and they do their stream and then they turn it off and that's it. Right. And, yep. Been there. Well, <laughs> at least with this, you know, there's these conversations are nice. They're clippable and you can use them on other platforms. But um, I think the biggest mistake a lot of creators make is they don't think about it like that. They don't think, how can I repurpose my live stream for other sites? So, yeah, I think that was for like me when like the first time I hit go live, um, was just, yeah, I'm going to hit it and yeah, somebody will come across it and yeah, whatever. And about three years end of doing it, I realized I was, it, it was just insanity. I was just doing the same thing, but expecting a different result. And yeah, it was, I realized that there is more to this than just hopping on here and playing a video game. You got to be interesting somehow. And that was something that I had to learn very tough. So mm -hmm. I, I can imagine some of the people that you run into when you're doing content coaching. How, how does that look? Like, wh where do you start with them at? Yeah, uh, the first thing we usually do is just assess, right? Because everybody's at different levels. Everybody's got different um, experiences and backgrounds. So it's just sitting there and really looking at their channels one by one and just going through red flags at first, right? What are the easy things that we can just grab and fix immediately? Because um, that starts to get you in the mood of, okay, you know, I'm, my stuff's not great, but it's not bad. So let's make these fixes now. Um, and nine times out of 10, it's stuff they already know. I, I make jokes in the call that I'm more <laughs> of a content creator therapist. I just tell them what they want, they need to hear, and they are already aware of it, you know? So nine times out of 10, it's just that iteration of, yeah, okay, I should have fixed this. So I'll do it now. That would be an interesting, uh, thing to put on a job application what's a former job that you had oh as a content and content creator therapist yeah. so oh yeah that is super <laughs> that's cool though yeah it's fun yeah i like these uh i was just messing around with uh the latency website and looking at the projects that you have here and obviously they're all geared towards gaming but all three of these things that I see here, your org, Frost Esports, um, play chart, which looks like it's a ranking of, of games, and then um, a place to find tournaments and things. All of them are a little bit different. What What is like your specialty, or how do you kind of round all of these things out? Where are you at right now? Yeah, um, so I will say my co-founder has uh, some crazy ideas sometimes. So play chart's actually his brainchild. I've just helped him kind of fuel it. He's had that idea for, he said, 20 years. So I was like, let's figure it out. Let's find a dev and build it. Um, but the, you know, the esports stuff is more my forte. So Frost and, and Latency GG is where I <laughs> push it um, and try and really build things that actually help people. Uh, that's the big thing. Okay. So from an yeah, that makes sense. So from an esports, so we're like Rory, you kind of just hinted at it that esports organization is kind of your wheelhouse, right? So we've mm -hmm. seen you in the last couple of weeks. We we connected with you when you made a tweet talking about RLCS in general and it appealing to orgs. I don't know if you've caught our previous conversations that Bucket and I have had, but that was something that both of us have kind of hinted at that we're not esports orgs owners esport org owners but this doesn't feel like changes that they've made are appealing to an esports organization and it almost feels like they're trying to force esports organizations out of their 
their arena completely. So from your standpoint, take a, tell us like what, what the landscape looks like for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And it, well, first things first, I pushing esports orgs out. It definitely seems to be the way that it's leading, especially with, and they're getting a lot of flack for it, but they're, they're social media tagging all the players and not the orgs. I was going to say uh, that know. one. Oh, um, <laughs> but even from like an org owner perspective, I mean, over the last, we bought Frost in April. Since April, we've probably gotten four or five teams in our DMs opening tickets, asking if we have a, want a roster per month. So, you know, we're filtering through players. And it's funny because it's always the same handful of players with different rosters, which I get. Um, but their expectations, I think, are a little off. Um, and I think that that tweet that you originally read, that's kind of what I was talking about, this misalignment of expectations between orgs, players, and the the developers running the esports programs themselves. There's there's just a mess, and I think it's on all parties, well, not I'm, just players. So I know Rizzo has said it in the past when it came to player contracts and how much players were getting paid. Um, he had made a comment, I can't remember when, but talking about uh, salaries being basically inflated right now and that there's a potential of what people have become to have come to expect. There is a very good chance that's not going to be the case within the next couple of years. And are, are you guys seeing the same thing? Like is it have other orgs just outpriced out everybody right now? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, we're not, where we were five years ago, realistically, in esports, right? Five years ago, people were willing to pay for whatever. They wanted their their logo and their brand on these major broadcasted events. And I get that, right? Um, but how do you tell people, like, hey, instead of five years ago, there's an improvement in what your pay could be, there's a decrease because the exposure is not the same, right? Um, so that's definitely something that you got to deal with um and yeah those salaries are the, are the key thing and trying to have those conversations with people that have had the same conversation with other orgs that are still willing to pay that um it's tough because there's rosters that whose owners i talk to and i know how much they paid for those rosters and i would never pay that much for those rosters really um so it's tough yeah that's wild like, yeah, that's super that's super interesting that there's such a disconnect, I think, in like you said, the players, the orgs, and maybe the game or the developers who put on the actual sport itself. Is this something that is because of where it was and now are there just not enough sponsors? Like what's the driving force behind the funding of the the players and the orgs? Like what is mostly due to that? Yeah. Yeah. I think I know a lot of people want to blame it on sponsors and I, I can understand that. Um, but you know, you can kind of cut out sponsors when you think about market exposure and the market exposure from five years ago to today, you could argue is bigger. Um, but I think people, at least how I've noticed, they care less when we get a sponsor for an event it is very, very hard for us to get exposure directly from those competitors to that that sponsor. It, people just don't. I think people have become hyper aware of that type of relationship, so they don't want to be involved in <laughs> in getting involved with the sponsor unless it really, really relates to them. So then, the you know the other piece is, well, what do I have to offer as an org to a player? What does the player have to offer to me if sponsorships are ultimately off the table um and at the end of the day I, tournaments just aren't as great as they used to be there's not that same level of exposure uh, we were talking about it and making a joke about the social media and not sharing that in that hype with the teams but it's dwindling so teams and orgs themselves are losing exposure um which thus is bringing less sponsors in. So you kind of start to see a trend of 
people not really caring about what the end product looks like and then brands just don't want to be involved in that end product at the end of the day so are like are you finding that so brands just have no interest in esports now is that is that where where it's going certain, certain brands so what i've noticed is a lot of the brands that are still that are involved today probably will stay involved for a little while but okay. i think brands that have tested it over the last 5 years and maybe didn't get the exposure that they thought they would they're just going to drop it. They're not going to try it again for another five or 10. Like a Ford um, or a mobile one racing. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a mobile one sponsored team that plays in our tournaments every week. You know what I mean? They're not really getting a ton of exposure. It's, it's a bubble tourney, you know? So, um, you could argue they are wasting their money. I, I can't make that decision. I'm not on that team or, well, I mean, know, so like, company, but, Rocket League accent is like focus something that stuck out to me was last year or two years ago, right? You know, you had Ford, you had mobile racing, like you had these big spot, these big name companies that were on the broadcast. And now this year, there's not one They're They're not there. And I remember when Buck and I went to Fort Worth for worlds and, you know, we saw the Ford Raptor sitting, uh, sitting out there. I mean, it was the Bronco. And the Mustang sitting out there. And I remember saying to Bucky, I was like, who is this marketed towards? Because the majority of the people in this arena cannot go buy a car right now. And they're not nope. doing oil changes. So how did they get these people to come in and sponsor this? Because, I mean, they were handing out cups and everything. Like, it was, it was baffling to me. And I think... It almost feels like with what you're saying, um, from like events like that, it, it's kind of like they're going, oh, we didn't see a return on that and this isn't worth our time. So now it seems like to be trickling down through esports completely right now. Yeah. And this, I don't know if anyone else thinks of it this way, but I like to think of sponsors the same way I think of orgs in tiers, right? So tier one orgs, they're going to get tier one sponsors. And they did their thing with tier one sponsors. And a lot of them did not deliver, right? Um, tier two sponsors, they're, you know, not Ford. <laughs> um, but they're still kind of spending money a little bit. Probably not as much in esports, but they're still there. Um, and the tier three sponsors, they're some of them are new. I mean, we just got a new sponsorship and it's one of their first endeavors into the tier three space. So um, it's lucky. I think if you're getting a sponsorship around now, you're, you're lucky in the right place, right time. Um, some people are just hounding the right people over and over again until they get that. Yes. Okay. We'll work with you. So yeah, mix of luck, mix of uh, different brands, seeing how others performed and either backing out or taking interest. So. Yeah, I feel like it comes down to numbers, huh? Like if they're not getting the customer acquisition that they expect to get from their exposure. Uh, Rocket League's un unique in the fact that there's decals and things that get sort of seen, but it, we've historically seen players at the upper level not even put those decals on um, in the major tournaments, which is super interesting, and orgs still sponsoring them. So I think there's just a disconnect there, and you're going to see the money get pulled out. And I think that's what you're seeing is these players expect to get thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands of dollars for a season or a month or whatever it is. And they're being offered hundreds because the, the orgs themselves don't have those, those advertising dollars don't have the, the, the backings. So then it comes down to what else? prize money you don't split prize money as a, as an esport or as an org do you or how does that typically work in these tournaments some so it's different we've had we have a lot of brand or orgs that come in and their players do split it and i don't think the org gets any piece of it um yeah and I think there's moist, is, Mo in. moist is known for that they don't take any of the prize money from the players yeah. And then there's some that do come in and like the, the manager collects the prize pool and then takes a cut for the team and then splits it among the players. So I think there's a difference or a, a, a pretty big dichotomy in that. Um, 
I am curious to know what that split actually is. And I'm hoping, I don't know this, but I'm hoping that that actually does kind of play into what their salaries are. Because I'd imagine a team that takes all of their winnings home, uh, their salary is probably a lot lower. I would hope. <laughs> you, you would think um, that, that that was the case. But like you said, we, we, we don't know, um, especially because player contracts is not something that is talked about openly um not like how we as we see in traditional sports where we get to know what are the deals that are being made with owners and players and how much is x person being paid um which they're supposed to be an nda but then somehow i mean players are players they end up telling each other anyways so it i, I can see as a as an owner where it starts to get difficult um do you do you think there would be any benefit to having transparency like that of knowing what everybody is being paid Oh yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I am a, I am a big proponent of transparency. Um, ever since I started hiring people for my projects, for anything esports related, I've always talked about that. Like whatever is in this contract, it's not a secret. I, I don't care. Share it with whoever you want. Take screenshots, give it to people. People do that. Um, they've done it with my contracts. I, whatever. Um, I don't see a benefit in hiding what people are doing or what they're being paid. It doesn't, doesn't help anybody. The only reason an org would hide that is if they believe they are undercutting somebody. Mm. That's the only reason they would hide that is if they hired two people to do the same thing or hired a roster to do the same thing and they're not paying them all the same. And I'm starting to catch inklings of that again. Like I'm having these conversations with other org owners and I'm starting to see some other players are not paid the same. And I get that. You know, wh why should a sub be paid the same as main roster? I, right. I understand that. Um, but if you've got three kids playing at the same caliber on an ROCS bracket, there's no reason they shouldn't be paid the same. That's almost subtly instilling your your lack of confidence in some of them, which over time adds up that that subtle lack of confidence is the reason why we see so many roster changes throughout this entire process. I mean, last week was a little silly. <laughs> what silly from what perspective? The amount of teams that didn't make it to top 16 and dropped one or two people from their rosters. Yeah, that's, uh, uh <laughs> that, that's no, sadly enough that's normal for rlcs that as soon as it doesn't go well the roster just disbands very quickly and they they start making onesie twosie changes um which is like you said yeah it's kind of it, it's something that's been in the scene for a while that bucket and i have learned uh very ego driven and uh can't seem to shake it out of out of the the scene at all um but i guess so from your perspective, the more of sharing the information as to who's being paid what, like that's beneficial to the team. Does it feel right now, like from an owner standpoint, that roster uh, player money, not how much they're getting paid, not being shared is actually more beneficial to the players right now. Cause I can see how that per how that scenario, it actually benefits the players. Cause if owners are technically not supposed to be saying, Hey, I'm paying, I'm paying first killer this much, then then the the players shouldn't be doing that, but we know the players are going. Well, I'm getting paid this much. Like you shouldn't. You need to ask for this much. And then uh, I'm guessing that's what comes back to you guys as an owner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't say it very obviously, but obviously, you know, there's some there's some players that'll come to us and say, "Look, if you can if you can give us this number, we'll we'll jump ship." And it, it's unfortunate that we get those types of DMs, but. That will jump ship. Um, I, yeah, oh, I there's, Lord. I I'm not gonna give any names. Right, or no, anything, we don't expect yeah, that. Yeah, there's there's definitely individuals that we've interacted with that just like they're good. I I'll give it to them. They're good, but um, yeah, if they don't feel something, and it might not even be about the money. It could just be they don't feel right with the roster, which is okay. Um. But yeah, they'll they'll let us know what number they want in order to switch. It it's just, are you the right brand that wants to go down that route? Um, I personally, I don't think I could do that. Even if I wanted that guy, I don't think I could poach somebody. What? 
I, I want to ask, what is the average number that's getting thrown at you right now? Well, so that's the thing. We're getting – we don't have a roster, and Frost right. hasn't had a roster in, I don't know, before I bought Frost. it's It's been a while. They've never had an a, NA roster, I don't think. It's all been uh, APEC mostly. Um, so the numbers I'm seeing are very split. I'm getting – Kids coming to me for the whole team for like 500 a month. I had a roster come to me and they each wanted 1500 a month, each of them. So the split that we're getting is big, but I will say the skill level between those two teams is not as big as the cost. And it, it, yeah, I had heard something out there of there were like, there were teams that, uh, didn't make it that were uh, making upwards of like, they, they didn't make it past the into swiss that are getting like upwards of 2k a month and i found that to be kind of shocking of holy crap like you're you're getting paid that much and you guys didn't even get to swiss like i can see from an owner standpoint of that's sorry we can't keep doing that you got to bring something in yeah yeah and the funny we said it earlier but the prize pool thing is just a piece of that too like bringing that money in if i'm paying two grand a month for you and you're not winning anything or what you're winning is less than that how can i justify keeping you one shouldn't have gave you that much in the first place but two even if you are and you're, you're already down that ship and you're sailing and can't go anywhere else yeah how how do you keep them you you really can't and that's the tough part that's yeah, when all the weird doesn't sad work. tweets come out. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's not even the price pool money too right it's like your exposure in the tournament you could sell merchandise that way you have so many more chances to to get more exposure for the org and the players and if they're not making it to those um to those times in the in the weekend with the most eyes eyeballs on it it's just it's not worth it it makes so much sense um you touched on a few things here about we we keep going back and tapping on prize pool stuff um but with some people just not getting paid recently in general in esports do you want to kind of touch on that and, and explain what happened and maybe your stance and what you're trying to do with that yeah yeah um so when i first started getting pretty vocal about it it was actually a tournament that uh frost was hired to admin um we were one of like eight organizers that was asked to just help help promote it help run the brackets whatever um we were actually hired by a third party that was working for the main organizer um and we kind of got paid um, it turns out that the third party that uh, hired us didn't get paid, but they paid us, which is kudos to them. Good on them. Awesome. Um, but it turns out that the uh, organizer has not paid any of the staff that worked it or any of the players that won back in November. So, and I checked today, still haven't been paid. So, yeah, this seems um, to be a common theme. Uh, that we've seen going on for like the last year and a half, as far as Bucket and I have been tracking it, like with the whole Women's Carball Association, and then they go to New York, New Org, and then Bunny's still not coming out. And like, what what's the process with that? Why why does it seem to take take them so long to pay that money out? Yeah, so there's there's kind of two factors, and one of them I'll give them, and it's it's legal, right? So if they're making a payment over an X amount there's filing that they have to do um the my counter argument is that filing takes five minutes i've done it it takes five minutes it's not hard um but i understand that when you're a corporation and you have a lot of people you know there's there's designated individuals that are supposed to do certain things and chain of command and it can get great i understand that um and that's makes sense for net 30 kind of payouts you know but when you start to approach it at 90, some orgs net 120. So I know some people that haven't been paid out for work they did two years ago. Um, you know, that starts to be kind of alarming. And uh, you can wholeheartedly expect that that organizer ran the event without funds in hand. And that's something that word is that 
phrase is something that I talk to organizers a lot about is funds in hand. No matter what sponsorship I have, I always have the funds in hand to pay out winners and staff. And if you're running an event on deficit and you don't have that funding, you shouldn't be running the event. End of story. It's it's immoral at the end of the day. You're essentially lying to everybody that they're going to get their money when they expect to get it. Um, but that's common practice. Uh, the one that I tweeted about a bunch, uh, that's what happened. The third party sponsor hadn't paid them so they decided they didn't want to pay anybody else so like, yeah that's insane <laughs> but most home services i mean think about it like if you want to have uh construction done at your house like you got to put a down payment because that guy's got to go out and buy the materials and then you pay at the end for the labor so it just makes sense if you're putting infrastructure down for a tournament that you're you're gonna need to take time and money out of what you're doing to make that happen. And if you're a professional organizer of these things, then maybe you can front that, but you should be paid immediately. Like that's just a, the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And some of it times ties, ties back to what we were talking about with sponsors, you know, sponsors are getting harder and harder to come by. So if someone really good comes, you kind of don't want to pass it up, but at the same time, you got to be able to pay all those people that you said you're going to pay, you know, <laughs> regardless of keeping that sponsor. Well, I have a hard time. It, you talked about like the morality of it, right? If I'm a sponsor and I'm going to put my name to something, I have a, I have, I have a hard time believing right now that the sponsor isn't going to shell out money to, to me. Oh, okay. So you're, <laughs> all right. It, oh. it, it sounds like to me of like, it, it's someone made a miscalculation of how much was going to come in and then they don't have the money to go back for it. So then they're going back to the sponsor asking for more money and then they're not getting that. But by your reaction, are you saying that there are sponsors out there that are promising and then not delivering on it? So yes and no. There's, there's two kinds of sponsors we've encountered. There's ones that pay us up front. They send us all the money immediately. It's our job to disperse it. Um, which is less common. Uh, and then there's the other kind, which is you tell us who the winner is, you give us their PayPal, we pay them. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily like sponsor number two, no. but I deal with it. And if those players do not get paid out in a timely manner, I pay them myself. Re regardless of if the sponsor is actually going to end up paying them, I pay them myself. There's no reason they should wait longer than they were told. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, there's definitely sponsors that I've not worked with because I choose not to work with them that have yet to pay people out. And it is entirely because they don't care. Um, there's an organizer that we got into a kind of spat with for a month or two, and they were doing some pretty immoral stuff to get players out of our events and into theirs. So I went and collected some information about sponsor payouts and i reached out to their sponsor and i said look you know you you gave this brand your money and they have yet to pay out any of it they, they're sitting on money you gave them so are you going to do anything about this and and stop this organizer from doing it or are you as a sponsor going to allow this and i was basically told we'll look into it thanks that's the short of what i got and they're still sponsoring that that organizer so it's it sounds like money know, laundering at that point. <laughs> so yeah, we could get into a whole esports legal thing, but how do you <laughs> how do you, you know, go after kids in their bedrooms that are sixteen and running esports orgs? You know what I mean? So Is that what a lot of these esports are like the lower bubble ones are ran by is just sixteen year olds in their rooms? Most I will say it's it's anyone that is under the age of 25 uh, is probably about 50% under the age of 25. And there's a pretty good split between kids that are under the age of 17 and kids that are in their college dorm running an esports org. So if we want to um, talk about an esports like bubble, like to me, that sounds like the esports bubble of what we all thought was going on. I mean, I'm not not tying in like the big name ones like we know who runs g2 you know who was running v1 um 
it, LG, all that, but it, it does seem like there's this low level, like almost sham going on that is duping people. Cause I, I remember, um, when I was, I was out of high school, I was in college and I got, I was playing call of duty and I got asked, Hey, one V one me and, uh, for a spot on an org. And I remember doing it and they're like, cool, we want to offer you this spot. And part of me wished I had done it, but then I'm after hearing some of this kind of glad that I didn't because it was, yeah, we'll send you all this stuff. And yeah. And I was like, ah, I'm good because like I did. Yeah. It could have been just some random person that was quote unquote running an esports org. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. My Lord. Yeah. The tough part and you know, they are the conversation I tend to have with people is like, okay, how do we, how do we monitor this? Right? Like, how do you monitor 17 year olds creating businesses in their basements and the reality is you can't and the one of the big barriers to even starting to have that conversation is just how different each esports scene is i mean if i told you about some of the stuff that the kids in the sspu scene tell me you'd lose your mind like in the what scene uh super smash okay yeah in the fighting game scene like some of those kids are coming from staff roles and player roles in orgs where they had to pay a few hundred dollars a month to be listed as a staff member so there's weird stuff just even going on in that scene so you know trying to put some blanket solution across every single esports scene is is just gonna be tough and probably impossible well it makes more sense now because there's not like there's a a board of trustees, a board of directors that is monitoring what is going on and everybody agreeing the terms. It is literally a, a, a free for all. And, mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. I've, We're not I'm, I'm getting educated. That's for sure. Bucket. What do you got? Well, we talk about a lot of the pitfalls and the, and the negative aspects that you've been dealing with, but you've been involved in esports and around this stuff for what? 10 plus years now, what are some things that you've seen evolve or changes you've observed that maybe are positive in the esports world? Like, why do you keep doing it? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think one of the biggest things that's changed is just opportunities. Uh, if you think a couple, even just three or four years ago, if you wanted to find some gig in, in esports, where are you going to start looking Twitter and have bots blow you up because you said graphic <laughs> design by accident um so i think one of the big changes is a lot of those chances and those opportunities to just get involved are coming more and more to the forefront college probably has a a, a good deal to do th with that i think more now than five years ago you start to see more kind of opportunities in the collegiate scene um but things are starting to become a little more mainstream people are in or at least aware of esports orgs and joining their discords and seeing tweets and uh you know all that fun stuff so there's there's definitely more opportunities which is great um because inevitably i think the lack of opportunities is the reason we saw so many kids in the room making their own orgs because they didn't get a chance to work for anybody else right they didn't get a chance to actually learn what's the, the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do so yeah it's almost every day i'm seeing tweets and posts on uh hit marker now and even i see some linkedin ones too of just really entry-level esports gigs so yeah you probably see in a lot of kids grown up watching these things and inspired by um, some of the trailblazers and people who have been around for 10 years or so and trying to decide how the, how do i get involved in that how can i help and and make that a career choice of mine. And like you, you've kind of alluded to throughout this entire podcast, there's ebbs and flows, there's ups and downs in uh, the economic value of esports and just about every aspect of it, just like any business, just like the economy in general. And, but I think esports is going to be around for the long haul. I mean, more, more and more, we're seeing technology take over certain aspects of things. Um, but also people 
put things down for a while, right? Like they want to not look at their phones as much anymore, or they want to go out and socialize a little bit more. And that's all going to, it's all cyclical. It all comes back around to there's going to be a time where esports is, is on the rise again. And, um, do you see this as a Valley right now, or do you see this like a pitfall? It's still, on say, the are we, are we, is it still going down? Have we not hit the Valley yet? Yeah, I know this has definitely been a hot word for the last year, at least, but esports winter, right? And um, I don't know. I think there's still a little bit of some downturn that we're going to experience with this. Um, I started hinting at this kind of idea, so I'll, I'll kind of say it officially here. But um, I really think a lot of esports orgs are going to get bought by actual companies. Um i.e. forward buying an org and turning it into their dedicated esports marketing department. I think, I will, probably not forward, but I think we're going to see it a lot with uh, candy companies, soda companies, uh, you know, peripherals, anything that should target our market. I think those orgs are going to get bought out by those brands and well i mean we've, think... we've kind of seen it with the the og team on rocket league i mean nolly became the first red bull uh esports player so uh, at least in the rocket league scene i don't know about any other scene but like that that's pretty big because red bull if you look at their advertising and everything they don't like actually advertise the product they're advertising a lifestyle so it, it seems like a lot of things like it could go that direction yeah yeah, and that's, I think, ultimately, and I, I've said this a few times, I, esports isn't profitable, and it, it's probably not going to be profitable by itself for a long time. Um, but you pair it with a really good brand that is selling to that market, the, that org will be there forever. Well, yeah, you look at, you look at what uh, Jake's done with, with, in KSI with Prime. You look at what Nate shot with Nate shot, uh, brought this up like last year where everybody was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this other thing? And he's like, I need something that's sustainable to be able to entertain you guys. Like I got to build it on top of something. I can't yeah. just keep relying on just you guys to, to actually feed it in. And then you've seen like phase phase went to the stock market, which we'll see how that plays out because it, somehow shot back up um but it, it makes you it makes uh orgs like moist very like it's very impressive because they're not they are completely backed by just their support system their fan base and it's it's very impressive to see what they have been able to do but i think they are the uh uh the they are the exception right now um for yeah sure yeah 100 Oh, and Prime yeah, reminding there. me in chat, he is too. Yes, Prime. I know we're we're gonna get him up here too one one of these weeks to to hear about the deleted story. Prove as well. it. Yeah, prove it. But our booking agent's not doing a great job. Yeah, I know. I suck. getting him up here, huh? I suck. Well, we are we are always um, getting the guests that we want. So if you want them, you better get them. Working on it. All right, so esports as a whole, like you kind of touched on that, um, it's not profitable. Um, so what what does make it profitable? Getting that other brand, or is it merch, or what? Like what what's the mindset going forward? Yeah, I think you know being bought out by another brand is a solution. I don't think it's the the easiest solution. Obviously, building yourself up to to be a presentable thing that uh, a brand like that would purchase, that's tough. It's it's hard, and I don't think a lot of brands will be able to do it. Um, but pairing yourself with a product or service, that's the route. And not merch. You can't rely on merch because <laughs> it is entirely dependent on your, your players and your creators who change all the time, unless you're moist. <laughs> um, but like we said, exception. Um, but a product or service that pairs well with your audience. There's, there's, and this is a weird example, but I'm good friends with a buddy who is building essentially a Minecraft plugin. And he's got this awesome few thousand member Minecraft community and 
uh, this plugin super unique and people are paying him. He's got 3000 people paying him 30 grand or $30 a month just to play on this plugin. Um, wow. And he doesn't even have, you know, he's not, I won't call him mainstream esports, right? But Minecraft's in gaming, so someone might call it esports. Um, I mean, I, I, I would but, consider Minecraft as some sort of esports. I mean, when everybody does the who can do the fastest run and everything and the times with that, it's it's ridiculous. So, I mean, there there is a skill to that. So, it, it could be classified in that way for sure. But, yeah, getting people paying that much a month to be a part of that, that's that's bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so that's just one product or service. But I think coming up with some concept that is unique to what you do is is essentially the key. There's, there's yeah, a lot of worries out there. Yep, right. Value it. So, OK, let me ask you this. When it comes to Rocket League, um, I have seen people hint at it seems the way Epic is going about this, that it's it, it's mirroring Fortnite. And I'll be honest, when they had Blast take over and everyone's like, oh, they run Fortnite, I was like, what do you mean they run Fortnite? Fortnite competitive is still a thing? Like, to me, it fell off the map. And then I go and look, and there are people still watching it. But from an org perspective, it seems that have orgs, like, fallen off of Fortnite? Like, what, what's the deal there? And what, what do you see going forward with Rocket League? Yeah, so... What I've noticed with Fortnite, at least, is it's very creator heavy. There, are, if there's a really big tournament, it's it's creator focused and it's really pitched to the individuals that have audiences that are very young, right? So uh, Tim the Tatman does one all the time, and a lot of his audience is very young. Yeah, Booga um, and like those guys. Yeah, yeah. So some could argue the rocket league audience is very young as well it's a it's a pg game it's very easy to kind of understand it's soccer with a car it, it's easy to get into and at least from a viewer perspective understand right um so i i don't necessarily i have an issue with the way that it's being done but I don't necessarily have an issue with it happening. It might it might actually in the long run be very good, but okay. I think it's going to be very bad for the next couple of years because Blast is not they have never done Rocket League. They don't understand the community, they don't understand the teams, they they don't get it and that's going to hurt. Well, I mean, that was on full call. display this past weekend, which I'm sure I'm sure people are working very hard. Don't yeah. misunderstand, but the quality that we were used to last year to now, I mean, it, yeah, everybody was finding every little thing that was going wrong. Yeah. Well, the tough thing, too, and I, I think something people need to keep in mind is what did Epic do, right? Like, people are pointing the blame different ways. People are pointing the blame at Epic. They're pointing it at Psionics. They're pointing it at Blast. Like, who actually did what? And I have... I have a pretty good uh, feeling that Blast didn't get to actually make a lot of the decisions. Okay. Um, and they were, they were kind of told how this season would go as like a transitionary thing. Um, I have a feeling next year is going to go a lot better, a lot smoother, and probably just be all around enjoyable. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think there's some weird finger pointing going on, but no one... That kind of ties back to transparency. No one really knows what's going on. I mean, we still don't know the location of one of the biggest lands that's going to be happening. That's right. Soon, right? Yeah, so, major one. We we still don't know. And that, that I don't I don't know how many episodes you've listened to us, but that's always been our biggest gripe was communication. Right? I remember we asked Raw Greg one time, like, "Is there a president of competitive Rocket League?" And he went, "Yeah, it's this guy." And I went, "Never heard of him. Didn't know that." Yeah. I'm I I. I, I'm used to traditional sports where we know who the commissioner is and they're going out and saying, hey, everybody, here's what's going on. And it felt like if we moved in that direction, then we would take this a step forward and it just feels like it's gone two steps back at this point. You look at that guy's Twitter, the, the president of competitive Rocket League? Uh, I remember looking before, uh, but I, I, don't think he's, I don't think he's the president of it anymore. So uh, there's two guys. 
that are essentially supposed to be running the show. Um, one's got like 1.5k followers on Twitter. One's got like barely 300. Um, and your argument could be, okay, who cares? Like followers, whatever. But my argument would be, people must not know, right? Because right. if if I knew, I'll put it this way. People know who owns Frost, and they DM me and they ping me all the time, right? Because I've made myself known, so I could get that feedback, whether it's good or bad, or I suck at what I do. I want it, because I want to make what we do better. Those guys, I don't know if they want that feedback. People don't know if they want that feedback. Like you said, people don't even know they're there, who they are. So, yeah, pinging the Epic account and roasting the social media guy is only going to get you so far. You should be pinging that guy and roasting him and saying, why did you give that social media guy no resources? Oh, I guarantee you that you... social media guy has muted so many people at this point, whether it's at Epic or anywhere. I feel so bad for him. I feel so bad <laughs> I did too. Yeah, yeah, leave the man alone. I mean, <laughs> we could sit here and hope and wish all day that they're going to do something different or be more yeah. transparent like you're talking about. And some of the best companies that I've been a part of either uh, working for or owning or whatever is completely transparent like you're talking about and always um, communicative in in all aspects like you're saying about salaries. That's awesome. Check for me. I love that. Um, everything to community engagement, which is where we're standing now, right? And the community engagement of Epic and Rocket League and RLCS and the organizers has been non-existent. And if we know that, right, if we know they're going to continue that hush-hush throughout the whole season, is there anything else that can be done to, like, stand it up, to make us believe in it? Um, or is that really just the only answer? Like, what else can we can we expect from these people? Yeah, it's tough, right? Because, and we talk about this with Valorant all the time, the community seems to be at mercy of the devs and, or the publisher. Um, and it's, it can be demoralizing, I think, and it, it can really kind of catch you off guard when these devs make, they make changes or they, they, don't talk about something that they should have talked about, or it takes them three weeks to talk about the thing they should have talked about. And um, I think when the community starts to understand that as a whole, they'll probably start to give up on those devs and start to lean more towards other orgs and organizers. And that's kind of what my hope is, is that these teams start to lean on organizers like Frost and and even like Deleted, who they do an event every once in a while, and Lotus 8, they do events every once in a while. Um, these organizers that do put on quality events for their community. There's there's Tier 2 organizers, there's Tier 1 organizers, and I think we need to see teams and players kind of shift their focus from these these dev ones to, to the organizer ones, and it's kind of the, the chicken or the egg thing, right? Because there's no way Frost is putting on a hundred thousand dollar Rocket League tournament next year. Like, unless some angel investor comes in, I'd love to. By the way, if you're listening, angel <laughs> investor. Um, but it's it's just not going to happen. So, yeah, how do we get people interested in our events so we can put on an event of that caliber and give them the exposure they want and hype it up and make people happy? You know, it takes time. Yeah, it does. Does more money in a tournament equal better players all the time, or is it? Um, so, it are there depends. Are, orgs I, can bring. I think there's players. tiers to it. We run we run hundred dollar weeklies. We'll get around fifty to sixty teams, same teams every week, same players every week. It's great. Um, we'll run a two hundred fifty dollar tournament, same teams, maybe ten more, um, five hundred dollars. I think we peaked 90 teams. So there's there's kind of a range. And even tonight, we did a $1,000 tournament. We got 70-something teams. So you kind of start to see that split in the prize pool, but it's it's like 0 to 1,000. And then the next tier, I'll say, is you could look at Bandits. If you hit 7,000, you're kind of getting it like maybe another 50 or 60. Um, 
you're no organizer is going to get what 900 teams <laughs> so um it's it's yes there's a kind of a, a tier to it um and you will see different kind of turnout inviting teams kind of helps too we invited deleted and, and pirates on a boat to day two tomorrow and i'm sure that had something to do with the number of teams we saw tonight we we're not expecting this many, to be honest. We were expecting a lot to do pretty bad, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It, it is an off. It, it, a little bit of an off time. Teams want to brush up and get ready. You know, teams like the Dad Squad. They they want to get in there and and be ready to go for for this coming weekend's open qualifiers. Um, You're such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> What? Even Greg said you needed to take a little, like, take a little pride in that shot that you had on Rettles. Yeah. He said you were being too humble. I'm um, stay that way too. Uh, question from the chat. Prime want to know how many did you, how many, how many teams did you guys end up with tonight? Uh, let's see. I just stopped looking at it because we were seeding seventy five. Okay, that's not bad. Um, yeah, and I, you know, the I'll be honest about it the reason we didn't think we'd hit that is we did the sponsor kind of forced us to do something weird which is hold the entire event on challenge without a communication system usually we use start and challenge so we can use the awesome features that start has like right. communicating with your opponent and automatic dqs and us not have to manually kind of connect teams um why is that what what because uh, i've done I, i've done an event before and was kind of handcuffed to the same thing like they wanted you to, to launch but i was way down the totem totem pole didn't get to ask the question but like what's the draw with that um yeah sometimes it depends on how the the sponsorship looks so our sponsorship with this new sponsor is technically a three-way deal um it was brokered by the team at challenge between okay. us and Hop, Hot Pocket. Um, so the caveat to that was the requirement to only use Challenge. Um, we have another program that we're part of with Challenge where we're allowed to use both. So my argument was, why can't we use both this time? Um, like you said, I'm pretty low on the totem pole, <laughs> apparently. So that was immediately thrown out, and I was told, I don't know, figure it out. So... <laughs> uh we had a really rough experience during this uh the last between seven and nine was actually probably my least favorite moment ever organizing a tournament um so we're we're gonna very hard push for it to be on start next month because it, it just it was a very bad player experience for everybody involved and i this community is fantastic they've Every single one of those person, those people showed us an insane amount of love and they understood completely and they, you know, vented and gave us actually very good feedback for us to give to, to the sponsor. Um, but it was tough. It was, it hurt manually creating channels for players to talk to in Discord. It, it oh, yeah. was a process. Then, so. then though, there in those days, um, yeah, that, that is super tough. Um, We'll have to put you in touch with someone who has a very nice uh, uh, tournament system on, on another website. Don't know if you've ever heard of Channel 3, um, but ni nice no. little plug in there for me. Yeah, we'll have, to talk, we'll have to talk a little more about that. That's a good up-and-coming sure. social media platform for gamers by gamers. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, it, it is a good one. Well, as we're wrapping up... Good what, plug, man. Thank you. I, I got it. I nailed it that time. You got anything, Bucket? <laughs> Yeah, I do. Um, I'm just curious. We kind of talked about this a little bit at the in the middle, and didn't really get into it. But aspiring esports professionals, kids trying to get into it, get into the industry. Um, I don't know what roles there are: business development, uh, organization, all the things. Like, what advice do you have? Knowing everything that you do now, like, where can people start, or what are the the smart plays for those guys. Yeah. Um, I think it, you know, there's some easy solutions depending on the role. If you, if you want to get into social media and branding and, and whatnot, do it for yourself. You know, that's the easiest way to kind of 
try something is to do it on yourself, create a fake brand, create a, even do it with your personal brand um, and kind of learn the marketing aspect of that social media side. Um, the other thing I try and at least tell people in college that are thinking about esports is don't go into an esports program and just a program for esports. Pair whatever you're looking at doing with some some more mainstream industry stuff. If if you really like code and uh, you know building out frameworks for crazy APIs and and whatnot, you can. There's opportunities to do that. We build custom code at Frost, but make sure you're also kind of looking into it and in kind of the mainstream industry stuff because that that opportunity and that entry level stuff especially in esports is getting tougher and tougher to find um and if it is there it's it's probably not paid and it's probably not paid enough for if it is it's not enough for you to live off of so um whatever you're thinking of doing in esports try and find a equal kind of role outside of esports something to pair it with a, a nice red wine with your steak at dinner basically notice notice who's your how he didn't say go and read a bunch of stuff and think about it and don't do anything he said do do do, do 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 just go do it man and i think that's a really good lesson for everybody because if you go and you just do you're more the you're more likely to either fail and learn something or succeed yep. and you're never going to get there if you don't just do, right? But also pair if you have a skill set, then you can bring that into the industry and then be in the industry that you want to be in. And that's what I took from that. I love that. That's a very very good advice pretty much for anything. The thing that you want to do, bring some sort of skill to that and you're going to be invaluable to that industry. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And if you kind of go into those thinking that you're going to fail and giving up when you do fail, that's going to be even harder. Don't give up. If I gave up every time I failed, uh, I definitely would not be here right now because I've had a lot of projects that failed. Um, but instead of failures, I like to call them pivots. Uh, I just pivoted one project into the next and that led me here. So that is probably out. the best advice you can give anybody right now that's coming up. That's it, right. Yeah. Don't take a fail. Like it, it fails. Okay. That's fine. It, next. Go, well, what's next? Go next. Like what's the next one? Okay. Well, Mav, as we wrap it up, where can people find you? Yeah. Um, I am Maverick the man on everything, uh, wherever you can search something. That's what it is. Uh, mostly on Twitter saying crazy things that get CEOs in my DMS. <laughs> um, but if you ever have a question or you need help with something, shoot me a message on Twitter or, or Discord. I'm always happy to be involved or, or lay some information out if I can help. Well, we appreciate you being here. Bucket, you got anything before we go? No, that was great, man. Thanks a lot for stopping by and hanging out with us and giving us a window into your world. And um, I learned a few things, and I'm I'm glad that we were able to chop it up, not only about Rocket League, which we love, but get some insights just into the generalities of of the everyday life and, and how things are going overall. So thank you for bringing all that to the table, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to chat again, man. I, I know as – as things kind of go up and down in the industry, I wish you luck too. And hopefully um, if you ever need anything to reach out to us, we have uh, like, like uh, Hoosier was saying, we've got some contacts in the gaming world that do various things, uh, organize tournaments or whatever. So it'd be interesting to see if we could collab on something. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And thanks for just having this conversation. I, I love esports. So any opportunity I get to, you know, talk with people who also love esports. Um, the conversations are just awesome and greatly appreciate it. Well, that's why we're here and we appreciate you coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a good one. Mav, thank you for stopping by. If you're listening on Google, Spotify, or Apple, or YouTube now, or Google is YouTube, yep. Be sure to drop a like, a follow, share with your friends, and we will catch you all next time. Until then, have a good one.